Okay, so for today's today's lecture and this this module, uh, we're going over chapter five, and I have here links to chapter four stuff for reference. So chapter four, as it says, just deals with job order costing. And well, it's not technically it's not technically true. I usually think of ABC as a as a as a modification of job order costing. Um, ABC has to do with activity based costing, or rather, the um, what is considered. Wow! Don't get on the wrong side of this desk here. It'll get you. Uh, they answer two separate questions. One is, where do you accumulate costs at the job level, or at the process level, or or, or elsewhere, uh, versus where, uh, how are we, what are we defining as, as product costs over here with activity-based costing. But the, the, the movement from chapter four to chapter five, I wrote the way I did because it seems to be the best way for people to learn. It's how I, I understood ABC when I was a, a student, and it's the way it seems like uh, you all seem to understand it best as well. So I actually wanna go into chapter four a little bit and, and catch up on that, even though there won't be any questions related to that. I think if we understand chapter four, then we will we'll be able to better understand chapter five. And so the basic gist of this week and next week is the problem of overhead. Overhead is a problem. Uh, I go through, go through some stuff at the beginning of chapter four, but the, the point is, is that overhead is a problem. I wanna get to this one little idea here. All right, so we have, we have some costs that we can trace to product, individual product units. We call them cost objects. Uh, cost object is a very general term, so you could technically place the cost object anywhere in the firm. And it's a very academic way of looking at it. It says, basically, we're defining whatever it is we're looking at. Are we looking at the department? Okay, that's the cost object now. What can we trace directly to the department level? We're looking at an individual job, this, this the Kaczynski job, like let's say, say we're plumbers or something. They've got a particular problem in their in their house. And that's this job. We've got certain certain materials we need, certain labor hours we need, certain overhead that's going to be incurred because of that job. Okay, that's the cost object. The job is, is the cost object. Okay, great. I'm, I'm usually going to substitute the word cost object for individual product units, what, individual widgets coming across the factory floor, individual jobs in the case of, of like, like a job order situation where you're a plumber and you have different jobs. Uh, it, just, it just makes more sense to think of it that way. And so what we have is we have direct costs and we have overhead. Absorption does does this. We, we can definitely just, everything inside the line here, now, not, not now, but right, now is a direct cost. We can trace it. Meaning Direct means we can directly trace it to that job. Oh, well, you know, we put that, that, that those yards of pipe we put into the Kashinsky home. We know we used up the cost of that pipe on that job. Okay, this is a direct cost, we can trace it. We, we know we spent this number of hours with these, ki these kinds of laborers doing that job, so we can, we can directly attribute those costs to that job, <clears throat> which would be important because you don't want to do a job that costs you $10,000 and only, only uh, charge $5,000 for it. That's called going out of business soon. Well, we have all these other costs, these overhead costs, that's at least one class of other costs that aren't direct costs, they're indirect costs. <clears throat> and... To a degree, each individual product unit or each job has some responsibility there. We have some reason to believe they have responsibility there. That makes them, them overhead. So overhead costs are costs we consider to be product costs. We're incurring these costs because we're producing this product, because we're doing this job. But it's difficult to directly trace how much of that cost is, is the, the particular individual unit or job or order is responsible for. So in the example of like a plumber, you know, you have a good amount of equipment you're going to use. You're, you're going to have a snake. You're going to have large equipment like, like trucks and, and, and things like that, that, that you're going to be using on different jobs. And there's a certain amount of wear and tear that comes with each of those jobs. And eventually that wear and tear will require you to replace the truck, replace, replace, replace the snake, replace a variety of other tools that you might have. I, I, we had a, I, when I lived in Pittsburgh, we had a main line rupture, which, which, uh, happened because the, the main line of the house carries the unmentionables out of the house. And 
when it was when this house was built in 1945, I think they built it with two foot sections of terracotta pipe held together with horsehair. That's how they would they would bond it. And so with erosion over the years, instead of being a nice main line that that, that slowly sloped out to the sewer, it, it went like this. So they had to jackhammer up the a good portion of the the garage and and relay a new lay a new main line and and refill and re put in the new, new cement. Lots of equipment involved there. There's jackhammer involved there. My house put some wear and tear on that jackhammer. The cost of the jackhammer is an overhead cost. They, it, it's not really clear how much of how much wear and tear went into that jackhammer from from my house, but it is related. It was used on the job. Clearly, some of the cost is is due there. So we have this kind of gray area, and so I have an earlier illustration right here. So. We have three different categories of cost. We have our direct cost, yet we can trace it to product units. And I put product units in this illustration instead of cost object, just to make it clearer, I think, anyway. Yes, if we can, if we can trace something directly to the, the product unit, then it's a direct material, a direct labor, it's a direct cost. That's the little triangle up there. It identifies this whole rectangle as direct costs. Now, if it's a product cost, or if we're a manufacturing firm, we call product costs manufacturing costs. So that's why it's in parentheses down here but it's not traceable, then we have it as overhead. Alternatively, you could ask this other question here, which as a, as a kind of heuristic, is it traceable to product lines? So in order to be in business, in order to do this job, in order to do this pro make this product, do we have to incur it? So let's jump over to like a manufacturing instead of, instead of being uh, in plumbing land. Let's, let's say we're a manufacturer and we produce in a factory a bunch of different widgets across the factory floor. And we have factory overhead that's associated with that, the cost of the actual building, the cost of the electricity in the building, the cost of a lubricant for the machinery, the cost of maintenance for the machinery. Those are all overhead costs that we are incurring because we are operating the factory. We're, we trace it to the, the product lines being produced at that factory. Yes, it's on this side. But no, those costs that I just described, we can't trace them to this particular widget that's coming across the factory floor. So it's in this middle area of overhead where it's a product cost but an indirect product cost. So in job order costing, I, I, I hope this, a lot of this is, is nice, nice solid review for you. You're like, yes, this is, this, is my, this is my jam. I got this. In, case, in that case, great. And if not, it's okay. That's why we're, we're doing the review as well for you too. The problem of overhead is what we're going to be solving in large part anyway the, the next six weeks or so. ABC, and we're kind of reviewing job order costing. ABC, in addition to job order costing, and, and process costing, solving at least partially the problem of overhead. What do you do with that cost? How, how do you figure out how much these product units are actually costing? And we have this really amorphous, problematic category of cost, of product or manufacturing cost that you, you can't trace. So the simplest version is job order costing where you just say, all right, we're gonna take all our overhead costs and we're just gonna divide it by some cost driver. So, you have a predetermined overhead rate in job order costing. This is, this is if we were doing chapter four questions, I'd ask a bunch of questions about PDOH rates. <clears throat> but don't worry, I'm not, I'm not gonna ask in chapter four questions, but this is important to, to kind of preface what we're gonna later do in, in ABC in chapter five. And we put, you, you, you calculate that by taking, usually it's done before the period. So you have budgeted overhead cost and divide it by budgeted Cost driver. Cost driver is something that you can trace directly to the cost object, and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna let the overhead hitch a ride on the cost object as being allocated to different widgets that they come across the factory floor. So, for example, I don't know how much a factory. Let's let's, let's say this supervisor supervisor time. Supervisor has a salary in the factory, and clearly we are incurring the supervisor's salary because we are producing these product lines. So yes, it's over here. However, we don't know how much time the supervisor stand, is, is spending standing over this particular section of the assembly line when, when the particular widgets come across. So, so it's not traceable to individual product units. So clearly the supervisor's salary is gonna be overhead expense here. But we might say, yeah, however, when when we have more direct labor hours on a particular widget, it takes longer for us to produce more, more direct laborers who are actually producing on the factory floor 
uh, not the supervisor who oversees them, but the actual laborers, when they are act, when they are spending more time on it, it's more likely that the supervisor is going to be overseeing that that widget and are going to be spending his or her time on that that widget or overseeing the work on that widget. And so what we can do is we can we're going to try and tie that supervisor salary as as overhead. Or make, the point is we're going to tie all overhead, for example, to direct labor hours. We do we can trace direct labor hours to Let's, I'm just going to put traceable. I don't know if it's worth, worth writing on the board, but direct labor hours equals traceable. If it's tra in this case, then then we're going to go ahead and say, all right, well, 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 we'll just charge, we'll charge that widget more overhead dollars the more direct labor hours that it consumes. So if this particular widget takes a lot of direct labor hours, we're going to charge it a lot of overhead. Under the, the 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 idea that overhead is related somehow, so we're trying to get some sort of correlation, some sort of association there, so that we can get an estimate, an estimate of how much the responsibility for overhead cost is. All right, there's there's the equation right here. There will come a time later in the semester when it's useful for you to, when it might be useful for you at least to review the idea of this overhead control account in chapter four. We're not, not directly touching on it too much. Okay. <clears throat> so I used, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I lost some people as I said it, but I was, I was trying to split between using specifically supervisor salary and overhead costs in general, because there's lots of different types of overhead costs. I mentioned factory overhead costs, like the equipment of the factory, the, the actual machinery in the factory, the utilities that the factory requires to stay open. And then I also also included, uh, also separately, I talked about supervisor salaries. So in a factory, you might have various types of different overhead costs. And I said, well, if we think that supervisor salary likely is correlated to direct labor hours, we might use direct labor hours as our our cost driver and then tie the overhead cost to it. Well, notice what I said. Because we think that the supervisor's salary, one type of overhead cost, is correlated to direct labor hours, we're going to tie overhead, all the types of overhead costs, not just supervisor salary, all of them to that wagon, and they're all going to be allocated based on direct labor hours. That's going to introduce a lot of inaccuracy. It's going to be a very rough estimate. And there are going to be some, some ways in which it can predictably be inaccurate. One of the ways to overcome this is to use a variety of department overhead rates. And so one department, maybe they use a lot of, a lot of the, 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 maybe, maybe in one department we have the majority of the overhead is that supervisor salary. The supervisor salary is a really big overhead in this department, so we're going to take all of that overhead in that department and tie it to direct labor hours because we think supervisor's time and effort is correlated to the direct labor hours spent on a particular widget as it comes across the factory floor. Okay, maybe the next department is has a bunch of machinery and a lot of equipment that has to be maintained. And that maintenance cost, let's say, is, is we expect, we're, we're theorizing at least, is going to be correlated with how many hours of machine minutes or hours of machine time is on is used on each particular widget. So the more the more machine time we have to use on a widget, the more it's responsible for all that maintenance cost. And if that's the primary overhead, uh, uh, if that is the the primary source of our overhead cost, then we're just going to tie all overhead costs to machine hours now. So let me erase this and say. MH for machine hours. And, and we can go on and on for different departments, but that's one way that you can you can make it a little more refined and say, well, we're not we just want one one kind of one size fits all PDOH where all overhead cost is on one cost driver for the whole firm, firm wide PDOH. We're gonna split it up by department. So the innovation for Chapter five, maybe C, is, is to say, that's great and all, 
but we'll just sit on this. This isn't necessarily what we need right now, but is to say that's great and all, but but you know what? The the responsibility for overhead is more refined than this, and and this this is still too too inaccurate. There's still a bunch of overhead that's not being not being properly allocated from Department 1 because it's not correlated to direct labor hours, and a bunch of overhead from Department 2 that's not being properly allocated because it's it's not correlated with machine hours. So what we need to do is we need to get rid of the existing structure of our overhead cost and simply correlate it to those drivers that we can we can trace and and let them let them kind of intermingle. All right, that's that's kind of a a vague a vague way of describing it. So let's ask a question here. Let me ask a question that's unrelated that I'll try to tie in. Okay, I'm not asking this to suck up, so you're not allowed to say this class. What are some of your favorite classes besides this class, which is obviously it's at the top of the list. You know, what? who has a favorite class that they've taken? About sports? Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. I got to sign up for that class. That's good. Thanks. I really need to sign up for that <laughs> class thing. But so a general, a class about, a general class about sports, yeah. Really? Okay. That that is that's a degree, a class in Star Wars. There. <laughs> okay. Was the final? You know, see if you could move a rock with your mind. No. I I. I got to explore the course catalog of this school a little bit better. That's interesting. Okay. Who, who else has a, a favorite a favorite class? Yeah. Took a class on conspiracy theories. Oh, it was, it's it's rumored to be about conspiracy theories at least, right? <laughs> cool. Interesting. Okay. Very very nice. Okay. Uh, let's narrow it down. Uh, how about a, a business college class that you enjoyed? Or a professor you enjoyed even the material you didn't like. Again, you can't you can't can't name me. I you know. I don't want to make anybody feel bad out there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's some nods as well. Yeah. It's pretty. Organizational behavior. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Everything about it you liked. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Other other. Dave, Dave Bjork. Okay. Cool. Cool. Anything in particular? That you just he just has a good, good style or. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I'm going to write down some some things that we kind of said. So we have sports class. We have a Star Wars class. Um, not missing one. Then the next was was organizational behavior, right? Sorry. Oh, conspiracy. Yeah, I, I knew I was missing someone in there. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to put OB organizational behavior, and then uh, fine. Uh, well, a particular professor. You know, you, what was his name again? Bio Jen, Jen Steffens, yeah. And then B J O R F, something like that. Bjorf. B O U R F. Sorry, I was trying to parse the vowel sounds you're making. B O U R F. Okay. Doctor, I'll, I'll, or professor, I'll like, be respectful in that. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so. Just, just we got we got a, a sample here, for example, of of different favorites from here in the business college from around. Uh, let's say we were trying to let's say let's say I didn't teach your favorite class, for example, and just you know it's hypothetically, and I was trying to say, well, how could I make my class your favorite class? 
Well, in order to do that, I'm going to have to figure out what makes a favorite class. All right. Well, I'm going to have to say there's here's a sample of favorite classes. Well, one thing I might do at least I, I shouldn't say I'm going to have to. One approach I could take is I could take a sample of people's favorite classes and say, well, what do they have in common? Okay. We could we could say, well, do, can we can we pull out one thing in common here? Are there some things that they have in common? See any patterns here? I don't know. Maybe I see a nod. What patterns do you see here? OK. I'll we'll do a different color. Easier. Put the relatively part in there. Easier can contribute to it at least, yeah? OK, the non-class classes, uh, I don't know. I tried to make it clever the way I wrote it, but I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, like, um, not to try to pull you into an academic topic, but if the op academic topic is coming to you, something that would be interesting to people, whether they're in a class about it or not. Okay. Yeah, very, very good observation there. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay, so we've already gotten, we already have here four just on a sample of five classes or, or professors in this last case. Well, we had a particular class that you were talking about with Professor Borough. Um, Four, four potential drivers of class favorite status. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to drive at here, one of the things I want to I wanna draw a conclusion from this is we have a very small sample of favorite classes. I mean, we could do this and actually get the favorite class of every single one of you. And we have uh, 28, 30 favorite classes. We get a much more robust sample. Uh, we could do that with, with throughout the school, maybe get you know hundreds, if not thousands of, of pieces in the sample. And I imagine that the the drivers would get more refined, but they would also expand in number. Be more, we, we, each one would be ah, well, this is what we mean by this. More we're seeing it tends to be this particular type of non-class class, or or this kind of easiness. Because if there were a class on on napping, that you had to come every day and nap. At a certain point, I think you might get bored of that and not have it up at your favorite class. I mean, there's a degree, maybe there's a curve of, of easiness. I don't know. Might be more refined into saying what, what that is. And likable, what makes a likable professor? The whole whole set of questions we could ask about that. And and how specific should the topic be? Is it about, is it interesting to have a whole class on, on this one paragraph out of uh, War and Peace? Or, or, or is it better to have the, the class be about the book, or the class be about the author that has several books, or, or so on and so forth. Yeah, that, you know, just as an analogy of how specific should we get. And I think we would find a few, a few more. We might, they might come out a few more that we, we didn't see necessarily from this, this relatively small sample. Okay. So similar to that, when we have a bunch of different overhead types, we're going to have a bunch of different drivers of them. And they're going to be all interconnected. Anybody ever had a likable professor that you didn't like the class because of the material? I see some nods. Yeah, yeah. So, so this isn't a perfect predictor, is it, of your favorite class? And you know, ever had a, a class that's really narrow in the topic, but you didn't like it that much? I see some nods. Yeah. Okay. So this also isn't, isn't a perfect predictor. This right here. It, well, I don't want to talk about. It. I already said about the easy class. You know, it's it's maybe there's a curve at a point where you're like, ah, oh, I just feel bad going in there. It's like a waste of my time or or whatever. If if it's if it's easy in the wrong way or too easy or whatever it is. So so we have, and I think we can say the same thing about that. I'm just not not parsing it really well how I would say it. Um, so they're not perfect predictors, but if we combine them together, all of them together, we might be able to predict get get a model of of 
Well, in general, based on a variety of, of inputs, how likely is it that this is going to be a favorite class? And, and we could do that. And that's what multiple linear regression is, or it's a version of doing that. If you've taken the stats 208, I think, you cover linear you cover regression at there in the second of the two series. Uh, a lot of you probably haven't. It's not a requirement. It's not a prerequisite for this class, but that's that's where you cover that. And that's that's what, that's what I do a lot in my research. I, I have a uh, this one research paper, for example, I'm trying to figure out the effect of employee volunteerism on employee productivity. So we have this corp how, how much in the reports that the company puts out, it says volunteerism this number of times or mentions volunteerism or gives a specific number of hours or, or it represents that this is the total hours of volunteerism, all of which suggest different levels of, of corporate interest and involvement in the idea of helping employees volunteer in the community. And I'm trying to correlate that to later productivity of those employees, which is like sales dollars over number of employees. That's, that's some measure of, of employee productivity. In order to, to put together something where I can say, I think this is the correlation between the input of employee productivity and the output of, or excuse me, the input of employee volunteerism and the output of employee productivity, I have to put in a bunch of covariates, a bunch of extra controls. I have to say, well, let's put in the regression. It's going to, employer productivity is likely to vary based on the size of the firm. So I got to put in a variable that represents the, uh, the assets of the firm. And in fact, I don't want it to be, to be thrown off by huge, huge firms at the, at the far end of the spectrum. So I have to put the natural logarithm of the assets of the firm to make it a, a nicer, a nicer distribution. And then I have to put in well, maybe, maybe firms that have good employee productivity just always have good employee productivity. So I have uh, current period employee productivity versus, well, is next period improved by, by the employee volunteerism? And I have a good number of others in there as well. As, as uh, off the top of my head, I'm not going to name them, and, and I, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole of being specific about my regression. But the point is I had to have a bunch of controls in there. And so if I were trying to isolate one of these drivers, for example, and trying to see how much does it cause it be a class to be your favorite class, I'd have to also control for the other things. I'd have to control for the other possible drivers of, is this class going to be your favorite? Likeable professor, yes, but is it in a class that's the right level of difficulty, the, the right level of relatability, which I think I'm going to rephrase that kind of like relatability, and specific enough topic? And, and once I've controlled for all those, and there's a likeable professor, now I can say, ah, this is really likely to be, to be a, a favorite class. OK. That's, that's, that's very similar to what ABC does. It says, look, we live in a, in a complex world. In fact, if you look at the reality as it actually is, it's infin infinitely complex. I already talked about the idea of this combinatorial explosion that happens when you start looking out into the future. Uh, there's, there's already a combinatorial explosion when you start talking about causal factors of, of, of things that we observe. And we, we would like it to be nice and simple. We want to simplify it because that's going to make the accounting much easier. But the simplification ultimately is... is a, 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 an unrefinement, is a, a, a coarse view, C-O-A-R-S-E, a coarse view uh, of, of reality. It's going to be a simplification that's kind of, a, a, in a way, you could say a lie. It's, a, it's going to simplify it and make it tractable and doable for us, but it's not going to get the real specifics of, of what's happening. We already looked at two, two levels of that. You could have a firm-wide PDOA trait. You could have department-level PDOA traits. And ABC can take that one, one, one step further. So let's... Let's look here at the chapter five text. I want to compare that earlier diagram to ABC's diagram. So one thing ABC does is it says, all right, just we just want to figure out all the cost drivers that are likely to be associated with overhead cost. And if it's a cost driver, that means we can trace it to individual product units, whatever the cost object we're talking about is. And we're going to get rid of the distinction between overhead and SG&A, which was that far, it was the category that's right here, not traceable to product lines even. SG&A standing for selling general and administrative costs. Because we say, ABC adherents say, some of those costs might actually be costs driven by, by us producing the products. And we would like to charge those costs to the products so we can know how much those products are actually costing us. And so what we have here instead is Instead of overhead being, instead of having our, our, our three rectangles, 
we have direct costs, and then we have all this over here as overhead, some of which is driven by these cost drivers in the individual cost pools. So we're going to say, all right, we've got, in this case, five different drivers. We know we can trace them directly to units, all five of them. We believe all five of them are correlated in some degree to overhead costs, some type of overhead, some type of overhead, or, or rather, some type of indirect cost. And we're going to have to, we're, we're going to try to allocate our overhead based on, on those five instead of one large firm-wide PDOH or overhead dri driver or department-level overhead drivers. So we can parse out. We can parse out, oh, you know what, that, that supervisor wage, we're going to have that driven by direct labor hours alone, whether it's in department one, department two, department three, whatever. We're going to have the machine costs driven by machine hours alone or primarily. <clears throat> All right, so this is how it does it. I want to build this in Excel. It does it through what I call the percentage weight table or the percentage table. So here, I'm going to copy this over. Machining, finishing, and other. So we have done some sort of a cost study and decided that in our firm, we do two activities. We do machining and we do finishing. Across however many departments we have, it doesn't matter. But each department, within each department, we do at least these two activities. And we might do some other activities, but we're going to, we're going to leave that alone for now. Uh, on the general ledger, we have overhead cost categories of shop supplies and maintenance wages. So this is where, this is driven, the, the, the columns here the columns here, I'm trying to type it out because I'm talking about it, <clears throat> are, are searchable. This is, this is information, these columns represent general ledger accounts in the financial system. Here, we're saying, ah, machining and finishing. And, and the, the, the trick is, we have, we have three different terms in ABC that we're using that reflect very closely collect, connected ideas. They're not synonymous, but they're very closely connected ideas. We're identifying different activities that we do. Well, okay, that's great. What does that mean? It means, it basically means stuff we think is correlated based on an activity driver, on a cost driver. We're going to say activity in front of everything because we're good at branding is what, what we're going to do. So instead of calling cost drivers, they're activity drivers. And so an activity has to be associated with an activity driver, and the activity driver is going to get an activity cost pool. But there's only one activity driver per activity and per activity cost pool. They all three go together very closely. So we have, we're going to have uh, an activity cost pool for machining and for finishing and, and for other as well. Again, we'll, I'll come back to that in a second. <clears throat> that means that we have some driver picked out that we think machining and finishing are going to be correlated with. And I think later on I, I say, yeah, so, so machining probably has, we're going to use the machine hour as our cost driver for the activity driver, I should say, for the machining. And we use batch start for the finishing cost pool. So every time we start a batch, we want to charge that, that batch a certain dollar amount because the finishing activity seems to be correlated with this batch start activity uh, driver. <clears throat> okay, so let me just copy over what we have here. Through this cost study we did, if I can learn how to use Nemlock, 0.5. Through a cost study that we have to do beforehand, oh, miscellaneous has been is also another general ledger category we have. We have dis discerned these, these percentages, which says, okay, shop supplies. 50% of shop supplies is due to finish or machining, excuse me. So we've gone through, we've studied, we said we've asked and interviewed our our associates, our workers, we've talked to, we've done, done studies where we've, we've counted out and, and tried to, to map out the time involved and done all sorts of fancy stuff to figure out, okay, we think 50% of, of shop supplies, dollars, that expense category is associated with our machining activity, meaning it's associated with machine hours. So we've, we pulled those shop supplies out of any and all departments they might be in, shop supplies cost. 
And now we're just going to say, well, 50% of it, we want to pull out the 50% that's correlated with the machining related activity cost driver. And we we also say that 35% of the shop supplies are are associated with the finishing activity. And then 50% we don't we don't think is are associated with any cost driver that we can measure. So we're going to put it in this other category. Maintenance wages. Well, 90% of the maintenance wages we think are associated with machining or which which means correlated with the driver that we're going to use for the machining activity, the machine hours driver. 10% of it associated with the finishing, and none of it that we, we think is any is, is not, not traceable. 0% there. Miscellaneous administrative here is going to split up into different percentages, very, a very different stack here. The other ones were all highest at the top, going downward. Shop supplies and maintenance wages, highest on machining, a little lower on finishing, and then down to very little or almost nothing on other. The miscellaneous administrative category, though, has the opposite pattern. It has 5% we think is associated with machining. After we've done our cost study, we've, we've determined that 5% is associated with machining, or machine hours, that is, specifically. 20% is associated with the finishing activity, which is driven by batch starts. And 75% is not associated with any of the cost drivers we're going to use. That's machine hours and batch starts, in that case. And so that's going to end up being something that goes in the other category. It just becomes a period. We, we consider it a period cost. And so now what we can do is we can take Yeah, no, I, I want to copy it. Yeah. We can take information about these different general ledger accounts. So let's just say these are the budgeted numbers. We think this, this year we're going to use $50,000 in shop supplies, $120,000 to pay for the maintenance workers, and $85,000 for miscellaneous administrative costs. So these are the numbers right there above their respective categories. And we're just going to divvy those out based on the percentages up here. Oh, I didn't need to make sure. Yes, that's what I want. Okay, so what that means is if 50% of shop supplies are associated with machining, and shop supplies are $50,000, that means $25,000 of that cost is associated with the machining driver and is going to go into the machining activity cost pool. That's what I'm doing down, down here, $25,000. Likewise, with maintenance wages, if 90% if of maintenance wages are associated with the machining cost driver then in the, and, the machining, and maintenance wages are $120,000, we expect $108,000 to be moved over to machining activity cost pool and, and so on and so forth across the grid. And we can sum those. And so what we've done now is now we have these three activity cost pools, as they're called. We have the machining activity cost pool, the finishing activity cost pool, and the other activity cost pool, and their dollar amounts. What that does for us <clears throat> is that that now allows us to say that's in the numerator, the driver associated with it is in the denominator, and we have much more refined individual activity cost pools. Uh, no, much more refined allocation of overhead. How many of you have seen news about chat GPT? Yeah? Sort of. Okay. How many of you have had it right in essay for don't 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 answer that. Don't answer that. Don't 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 cheat. Okay. Anybody tried it out? All right. Uh, did you what was your experience? Well, I'm gonna be careful because people ask weird things to chat bots. Uh, anybody have a shareable experience? Uh, did you like it? Not like it? Haley, yeah. When you when you read it, did it sound like it was it could have been a person who wrote that? Yeah, I mean I didn't like really read it, but I mean it didn't change your life. Not okay. 
<laughs> yeah, cool, cool. You said something. Nice, and it, it got it got the math right. Cool, yeah. Give the first hundred lines of a script with with those 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 categories, uh, those parameters. Yeah. Why should I break my arm? Did it did it convince everybody to break their arm? It, <laughs> okay. Wow. Cool. Okay. Wow. So next semester, this will be this class will be taught by the chat bot, uh, apparently. I was like, yeah, it's okay. So really cool. Um, <clears throat> what I'm getting at is the chat bot uses an immense mountain of data and a lot of training on that data in order to mimic what a, a, a human would write, what a person would write. That's the idea. It's supposed to chat like a person. Uh, and, or let me phrase it this way. It put, takes all that data and figures out the correlations between them in in an in an immensely complicated way, in an immensely uh, refined way, so that it can say, well, this would be a good essay on cats or script. This is the this is these are the parameters of say a script, a movie script, and this is what wouldn't be in here. This is what would be in here, and here are the parameters that the, here's here's what this person said. An outer space with three people. Okay, so I need to have it in outer space with three people. So. It, it, it's able to discern between what is not an, an outer space script versus what is an outer space script versus what is a script that has three people, what is a script that does not have three people, and put that through the natural language filters of, well, this is how a person would say it if they're, they're speaking uh, acceptable or typical English, given the training data that the, the chatbot has. The key word I want to extract from that is, is it's, it's kind of a pinnacle of refinement of predictors. So to get such a, a clean output, we have a, a very, a very smart stuff in the middle between the input and the output. It said, okay, well, given this input, I need to have this output. And it's got very smart network of, of knowledge built in there and a refinement of that. ABC is a very infantile version of that, but it's kind of in the same direction. It's 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 phenomenally underpowered compared to something like chatbot, but the same spirit is is involved in it. The same the same idea, the same zeitgeist is in this of saying we have drivers that are that are that are pushing overhead cost here and here and here, and our GL categories are not up to the task. Those that fifty thousand, hundred twenty thousand, eighty five thousand, just on its own isn't 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 up to the task. Let's push them through this filter of the percentage weights, get them in the new categories, and, and try to get a stronger and closer approximation. And unfortunately, that means that, chat, that, that, that ABC will never, never convince you to break your arm or anything. It won't be nearly as cool. But it, was a, it has been adopted by a good number of firms because it does indeed refine the, the accuracy of your overhead allocations. All right, so let's go, back, let's go back to this idea. And we'll get to some ABC problems before the end here. All right, so, so now we've gone through. This is called first stage allocation. We started with this. We end with this. We start with GL categories. You can go look up in your QuickBooks, in your Peachtree, in your SAP. You can find out what the balance of those categories, at least in the budgeted categories. And that's great, but it's not refined enough. Each of these categories contains a portion that is driven by a variety of drivers that we could be tracing to individual product units. And now... We're going to use this percentage weight table to create new pools as if they were almost as if they were overhead cost categories in the GL, the general ledger, that we're going to have be our, our how we charge overhead costs. And so then what does the example do here? So I, I can I can complete the table here. 
this is just a check figure to make sure. Yeah, we've still got, we've, we've accounted for all of our shop supplies and all of our maintenance wages and all of our, our miscellaneous administrative. And in fact, we can also make sure we have right here, total overhead cost in our new activity cost pools is $255,000, which is the same amount we started with. We are not increasing or decreasing the overhead cost. We're just slicing it up differently. So now, oh, okay, so we firm, we, the firm estimates, so let me, let me copy this over. And no. Doesn't want me to. I'm trying to be clever and it's not helping. Let me be clever. Oh, it's killing me here. Okay, so after 15 minutes of struggle, didn't want me to let me transpose. I, 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 I uh, haven't quite mapped out when it likes it and when it doesn't like it. Uh, let me transpose. That's, that's my own fault. Okay, so we have here though, okay, so we have, we're expecting 5,000, we're, we're estimating our budgeted drivers here. We have two drivers, remember? Because these, these two right here have drivers. The other category is just going to be period cost. We, it's other, we, 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 they're, they're not going to be allocated. It's not overhead, it's going to be allocated to product use. We, it doesn't have, what does it say? Does not have an activity driver or activity rate and is considered a period cost. Okay, so these two though, each has a, each of these two has a driver. So, 5,000 machine hours, 500 batch starts. So we can take these, the dollar amounts, and divide them by divided by that, that those, those cost drivers, those activity drivers. And now we have a dollar amount. So for every machine hour that gets used in this company, based on our understanding of what the machining activity does, we'll charge that widget, job, order, whatever, $27.45 per machine hour. Because of the overhead that is correlated, based on our study, with machining. And machining's machine hours cost driver. And for every time we start a batch, now the, the rationale here, in case this is, this is seems weird, the reason why you might do that is, let's say we have a lot of, we have, we have some machinery and we have to clean the machinery or reset the machinery in some way with each time we start a new batch, which likely consumes labor and materials and wear and tear on the machinery, a bunch of overhead costs associated with that. So we might have a, a driver of just batch starts and the finishing activity seems to be associated with that in this example. We're gonna charge the, the batch 93 bucks every time it starts. All right, so that's that's the basic idea there. And then and then as job OP57 or unit OP57 comes across, consumes six machine hours and 50 units in the batch. We're gonna charge it for its machine hours, it's gonna receive $164.70 from the machining activity. And it, the batch as a whole will be charged $93. OP57 then would be responsible for 50, 150th of that since there are 50 units in the batch. So a buck 86 in finishing costs. Now let's contrast that. Uh, I don't have it here, so good, I'm gonna do this new. Let's contrast what it gets charged, this amount right here, 166.56, versus 
unit OP57 job order costing. So let's say, for example, we decided, you know what? We think all our overhead costs are simply driven by machine hours. So let's take all our overhead costs. That's overhead costs. We're expecting 5,000 machine hours. So we develop a predetermined overhead rate of 51 bucks per machine hour. Now, here I'll reference. Given six, given six machine hours that are consumed, under job order costing with this kind of setup, we would charge unit OP57 $306 for overhead. Now we could refine a little bit. We could say, you know, we're not going to consider miscellaneous administrative to be an overhead cost. So let's let's make that a little less. Oh, we got a little closer, sure. $204 now. But if we're in a competitive environment and we're deciding whether or not to make unit OP57 and we're at the point where between competitors around us and what it costs to make us, what, what the, or rather, what the market will bear in terms of how much we charge for unit OP57, it's very possible that that, that $40 difference in costs could make us say, under job order costing, ah, oh, this isn't, this isn't going to be profitable. It's just too costly. But when we refine, because we're going to take several cost drivers and and, alloc and and pull out the amount of each of the GL categories that's associated with those cost drivers, get a more refined picture, we can see, oh, it's, it's actually going to be charged $166.56 of overhead cost. That's $40 less than we thought. We can compete with this. We can do this. And we, we, we would decide then maybe, hey, let's go ahead and make you know, OP57 and be more profitable. So it helps with your decision making by, by being more refined. All right, let's do some problems. And we'll, we'll actually come back to that Excel file, but we'll do that later. Oh. Okay, so in the standard ABC quiz, we have a good variety of questions here. Ah, yeah, I didn't I didn't quite finish one thing I was going to do. I told you this is first stage allocation. When, when you get to the uh, activity cost pools, that's your first stage allocation. You've allocated these dollar amounts into this. Okay. Second stage allocation is when once you have the activity rates, you're going to allocate overhead to individual products based, charge them basically based on those activity rates. So first stage allocation leads to this, which, which inevitably infers what the activity rates are. And then once you have the activity rates, you, you, can, you have second stage allocation. So it has two stages of allocation. OK, now, there are questions like this. And this question is about first stage allocation. You see the percentage table? Just think, oh, he's going to ask me about first stage allocation. And that's, that's one of the things that, that I'm trying to include in this quiz to make it worth your while. So it's if, if ABC is quite a, a review for you, you're like, I, I get this pretty well. Um, a lot of times in the introductory classes, they don't cover the full, the full process. And so some of these questions, a good number of these questions are designed to include first stage allocation and designed to give you um, some activity-based management opportunities, which uh, I'll explain that in a second. Okay, so this one is about first stage allocation. We'll come back to that. This is about Calculating the activity cost rate or activity rate for a particular, this is a very, very simple question, for a particular uh, cost pool. All right, so let me, let me say it this way. And lay out the kind of questions you're asked. Uh,
Some question that in some way requires you to develop an activity cost pool, like that percentage question number one on this, this quiz, this version of the quiz right here. It's, it's asking you which of these is false, and, and each of these answer choices is some amount for a, an activity cost pool of some kind, something related to that. So you have to use the information from GL categories and the percentage table to figure out what the activity cost pool is for each of these and then determine which one is of these statements is incorrect based on that. Once you have the activity cost pools, which is what this one has, looks like this bot, this, this right here, this column, gives you the activity cost pool. First stage allocation was already done for you. And we have our driver consumption, which is going to be the, the, the denominator, how much are, we're expecting uh, for each of these drivers. Have some questions which ask you to develop uh, to calculate activity rate, which is relatively it's, it's relatively simple. Those, those questions rarely give people problems, but I want to give you points for them if you know them. And let's, let's come back to that. Activity rate, activity rate, and then. Questions that say, go ahead and allocate allocate overhead costs to, and tell me what the total overhead or total cost overall is to for this job or for this this product. So here, you're going to have to. This this question actually gives you activity cost pools right here, and driver consumption, and then tells you how much of each activity driver is consumed by this job, these, these jobs. Oh, this is the one job, one of the ways. And wants you to then allocate based on these activity rates. So you have to do two things in this. You have to calculate the activity rate and then use those activity rates to allocate overhead. This uh, very similar. What is the total cost of this park? And the trick here is you're going to want to solve this one the same way as this, but there's a key word difference. How much overhead is assigned to the job in this question versus what is the total, total cost of that park? Okay. We spend a lot of time thinking about what's going on over here in the indirect costs, in the overhead land, in activity-based costing. But don't forget there still are direct costs that we can trace. So the total cost has to include those direct costs as well. So this kind of question right here, to give away the game here a little bit, you know, I can't trick you on these questions as easily. This sentence is very important. So do all your, your activity-based costing business in terms of figuring out rates for each of these and, and charging the job based on those rates and its consumption of the individual product uh, activity drivers. But then also remember at the very end, you also have to add in the direct, cost, the direct costs. And so, you know, I do see uh, two answer choices that are $20,000 apart. So if I had to guess, I would think when we got do all the calculations, the overhead allocated to this job, this park is 18250 and you're tempted to answer that once you get there. But the correct answer for the total cost of the park is that 18250 plus the 20000 in direct costs. Does that make enough sense? Or not? Yeah. No, no, it doesn't. Um, it's not going to get allocated to, to a park because it's, it's going to be considered as just a period cost. Yep, yep. That's a good question. Okay, uh, here's another first stage allocation question. And that is that. So let's come back up to this one. And I believe I put all the activity-based management questions in, in here. And I am not sure why it's so ugly right now. There. Okay, so if it's not formatting right, 
Check the width. See if you can't play with the width to get it to format better. Uh, moving these questions, some of these questions from Blackboard over to Canvas is a, is a very fun experience. And played around with some of the formatting of the tables. So this one, for example, it, it, it's kind of asking you about, about these two product lines, like as if we're going to make some sort of a decision based on almost like a keep or drop decision. We want to know how much more profitable one line is than the other. Or maybe not keep or drop, but maybe it's a prioritization uh, decision. Uh, which one do we want to promote more, spend more money on, uh, getting, getting the word out there that it's, it's, it's our product. And, and so we can, we can use activity-based costing to get more refined information about the whole product line. And that will tell us something down here. So there are questions that are activity-based management, which simply means making some sort of decision based on activity-based costing numbers. It sounds way more complicated than it, than it is. So let's pick a couple questions to do. Let's do one of the uh, first stage allocation questions really quickly here. So let's look at this one. A firm manufactures armored cars. Oh, I want this over there. Oh, wow. We almost entered an infinite regress there. Watching ourselves, watch ourselves. <clears throat> And go back down to it. Okay. So a firm manufactures armored cars. This firm is adopting activity-based costing. It has decided upon four activity cost pools and activity drivers. So we have here we have the, the name of the activity. It's not terribly important, just it's important for placeholders. Make sure you know which one is which. And then the name of the, the driver. Also not terribly important in this case, but there it is. We have we have four pools, the last one of which is the other category. And I, in almost all the problems, I include the idea of the other category because there still are some period costs. So if I, in this example, if I very carefully cut out, let's say this is a piece of paper, and I cut out each circle, because I'm going to take that cost pool, number five here, and distribute it to, I'm going to push it over to the, the cost objects that I'm interested in, and I'm going to cut out this circle and move that over and cut out cost pool one and allocate that, and cost pool two and allocate that, and cost pool three, I'm going to cut out all the circles. What I'm left with is a Swiss cheese. This weird, like, leftover. That's the other cost. And it's just going to be a period cost, just like typical SG&A would be in, in a, in a non-ABC kind of firm. But we're going to consider an activity cost pool separately. That's, that's how I, all the questions are going to deal with it when they deal with it. All right, we have our, our overhead costs. These are general ledger categories. And there they match the rows down here. And we have our activities, which are up here in the columns. So it's going to be pretty simple. We're going to copy over the same idea of what we have up here. I'm, I'm literally, literally going to copy it over. Change the names. Machinery, welding, polishing, shop. Nope. Let's see if it's going to let me. Oh, it doesn't like that. Is it the cut? Yeah, it doesn't want me to transpose when I cut it. What? Framing, welding, finishing, other. All right. So yeah, I'm just recreating this table right here. Let's see if I, it'll how nicely it'll play. Let me copy the table. It does. Okay, great. So I've got all these percentages here. Let me get rid of these. All these percentages here, framing 40% of machinery costs are consumed or associated with the framing activity. 20% uh, are associated with the welding activity. 20% are associated with the finishing activity. And 20% are associated with other, which means they're not associated with any of the cost drivers that we're going to use. Welding, likewise, I got all the numbers the same. 50, 10, 20, 20, 20, 20, 40, 20 here, 25, 50, 25, 0. Okay, and now I need to copy over the 
copy over these right here. So I'm just copying those over. I'm going to give myself some space. So I've got the percentage weight table here. I've got the dollar amounts of the GL categories, the general ledger, the cost resources is the term that's used in activity-based costing. And I'm now I'm going to take these, make the row fixed. No, sorry. Stick with me here. Just want to Make the names right. Okay, so from this five million, uh, no, see, this is I did this wrong because in the example I had it set up the other way. In the example I had it set up where the geo categories in the, in the textbook geo categories were in columns and the activities were in rows. In the problem here, it's set up where the activities are in the columns and the geo categories are in, in the rows. So I need to put these numbers over here, make the columns absolute, and then multiply by the table and just take it, control R, take it down, control D, have it fill in. In case you're wondering what magic I was doing over here. So of this $5 million in the machinery geo category, 40% of it, or $2 million, is going to framing. In fact, I'm going to stop there because the question says framing activity cost pool. If we check, we got all $5 million. Don't worry, we got all the activity, we, uh, all the overhead costs. Let me zoom out one. Oh, it didn't work. Okay, 5 million, 5 million, 1.05 million, 1.05 million, 1 million, and 575,000. That matches. This is, this is the sum of all these. We just, we just allocated, to split them up over the, the different activities we have. Okay, so we just want to know what the sum of this framing activity is. It says, what's the budgeted framing activity cost pool? So we can just sum these. So it's 2,868,750 right here. What are the distractor answers? Are there the others? Now there's one. This is adding machinery and shop supplies, and this is just machinery. Okay. Questions on this one? What well, parts parts that don't make sense? All right, let's do another question real quick. Uh, this one, I wanted this one. This is the answer here. Great. So here we have, this is Kuna Parks. This is Armored Cars. We have uh, three activity cost pools that have drivers. So I'm just going to focus on those three installs. And I think I can do this in the last three minutes of class here. Uh, well, I guess I'm just writing down there. I guess I'm writing down the driver, which is fine because there's only one driver per activity cost pool. So it doesn't, I personally, when I'm solving the problems, don't care about the name of the activity. I just want to know its driver. <clears throat> okay. And for each driver we have, this is the, Budgeted, but it doesn't really matter to me right now. And the amount of activity driver expected. Total activity driver. And we're going to divide these to get activity rates. Okay, so for the installation activity, our driver is installs. We have $90,000 in the activity cost pool because we already did all this business. And $90,000 was in the, the, the bottom of the column. The sum of the column. That's the 90,000. And we expect 100 installs this period. That's the budgeted activity driver. So for each install, we're going to charge $900. So we have a park, consumes 10 installs, 20 work orders, and 150 supervisor hours. 
We're going to multiply each of these by the rates. And we get to 18,250, which is total overhead cost allocated. But we still have some direct costs. Total cost of the park is includes the twenty thousand in direct costs, and the eighteen two fifty that we calculated by getting rates and multiplying them by the consumption. So this is a park consumes, and this is charge to a park, whatever that one park is. <clears throat> okay, questions on that? Since we're that's all we're gonna do today. All right, so I think on Thursday the plan is I'll go over uh, we'll start just hitting the problems. That's what we'll do. Uh, if I, I I'll, I'll double check. I believe there are some activity based management problems that they'll be a little bit different in in kind from the others. If you if you come across them in the, in the quiz. If one bothers you, email me between now and Thursday. That's fine. And uh, if we're pretty satisfied with the standard ABC quiz, we'll, we'll start talking about the advanced stuff for, for next week on Thursday. Okay, thank you.